Hello and welcome to the Minimum Competence episode for Thursday, October 26, 2023. I'm your host for today, Gina Leahy, a real estate and finance attorney from Philadelphia. In today's episode, we have Ford comes to a tentative deal with striking workers, a new NLRB rule on joint employers that has implications for franchisors, and the so-called next-gen bar exams debut has been delayed until February 2028. Let's put some potato chips on our sandwiches and read today's legal news. But first, a quick note here at the top of the show. We've turned on subscriptions for Minimum Competence at minimumcomp.com starting at $8 per month. The idea is that we'd like to be able to devote more time to Minimum Competence and enabling folks that find value in the show to support it monetarily is one way that we can further that goal. For most listeners, nothing will change. You can support us if you like, but daily episodes will remain free, as well as transcripts and resources that you can find on minimumcomp.com. For folks that are looking to access shows from more than two weeks ago, they'll be placed behind a paywall. This way, most listeners can continue to listen without interruption. And folks that have more niche requirements or those of you who have the ability and desire to support the show can do so at your option. That's it for now. Thanks so much. On this day in legal history, October 26, 1916, feminist and birth control activist Margaret Sanger was arrested for her pioneering efforts in promoting and distributing birth control information in the United States. Just days prior, on October 16, 1916, Sanger had opened the nation's first birth control clinic in Brooklyn, New York. This clinic, known as the Brownsville Clinic, aimed to provide women with information on contraception and family planning, both of which were highly controversial topics at the time. Sanger's arrest came as a result of violating the Comstock laws. By way of very brief background, the Comstock laws were a set of federal and state statutes in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries aimed at suppressing and regulating what was considered obscene or immoral materials. They were named after Anthony Comstock, a social reformer and secretary of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice who lobbied for stricter regulations on materials he deemed indecent. The laws were primarily focused on issues relating to obscenity, contraception, and abortion. Shifting our focus back to Sanger and the Brownsville Clinic, the clinic was quickly shut down and Sanger faced charges for her actions. This arrest and subsequent trial were pivotal moments in the history of birth control in the United States, ultimately leading to increased awareness and acceptance of contraception as a fundamental aspect of women's reproductive rights. Margaret Sanger's advocacy laid the groundwork for the eventual legalization of birth control. The United Auto Workers, or UAW, has reached a tentative labor agreement with Ford, potentially ending a prolonged strike that has been costly for the automotive industry. Ford has agreed to a record 25% hourly wage increase over the four-year contract, and with cost of living allowances, the top wage rate is expected to increase by 33%, exceeding $40 an hour. Ford, the automaker with the largest UAW workforce among Detroit's big three, was the first to offer a counterproposal and now has become the first to settle. UAW leadership will vote on the deal on October 29th, followed by a ratification by Ford's 57,000 U.S. hourly workers, a process that may take several weeks. The strike had revolved around various issues, with pay being one of the last points of contention. The UAW had initially sought a 40% raise and a 32-hour work week, but scaled back its demands. Ford had already agreed to cost-of-living allowances, converting temporary hires to full-time positions, and expediting the time it takes for workers to reach the top wage rate. Details about wages and benefits at battery plants were not included in the initial announcement, so it remains unclear if the agreement covers Ford's four battery plants currently under construction. The strike, which began on September 15th, grew to involve more than 45,000 workers at eight assembly plants and 38 parts distribution facilities. General Motors and Stellantis will meet with the UAW with hopes that they will agree to similar terms. The UAW urged Ford workers to return to work during the ratification process to keep pressure on the other two automakers. GM and Stellantis have expressed their commitment to reaching agreements as soon as possible. 
The National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, has introduced a new final rule that makes it easier for multiple companies to be considered joint employers, sharing both liability for labor law violations and the legal obligations to engage with unions. This rule replaces a regulation put in place less than four years ago, which had made it more difficult for companies to be classified as joint employers. The determination of joint employment status, whether through regulations or case law, has been a subject of contentious debate over the past decade. This new rule broadens the criteria for establishing joint employment, extending beyond situations where one business directly controls the most critical aspects of a worker's job. The updated test now considers indirect and unexercised control as well. This means that if a company exerts influence over another company's workers, either through an intermediary or they hold contractual authority over employment terms, even if that authority is never exercised, it can be considered evidence of a joint employer relationship. This change in the joint employer test has significant implications for industries like franchising, where independently owned franchise locations might have to negotiate with unions if both the franchisor and the franchisee are deemed joint employers. The National Conference of Bar Examiners, NCBE, has announced that the current version of the bar exam will continue to be available until February 2028 extending beyond the previously planned retirement date of July 2027. In addition to the existing uniform bar exam, the NCBE will introduce a new next-gen bar exam in July 2026. During the two-year overlap, states will have the option to choose between the two exams before the uniform exam is phased out, leaving the next-gen version as the sole option. The decision for which bar exam to use will be made by individual state courts, bar associations, or law examiners. The extension was prompted by feedback from some courts, which expressed the need for more time to transition to the new exam and to provide law schools with ample notice regarding which tests their graduates would take. The next-gen bar exam is designed to emphasize legal skills and reduce reliance on memorizing laws. As of now, no jurisdiction has committed to using the next-gen exam upon its debut in July 2026. Thank you so much for listening to Minimum Competence, your daily news podcast for lawyers. If you're looking for more than Minimum Competence, links to further reading on all of the topics touched on today are in the show notes. If you have any questions or story suggestions, find us on Mastodon on the esq.social instance. I'm at Gina and my co-host Andrew is at Andrew. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and do not represent those of any organization we may be affiliated with. Nothing here should be construed as legal advice because it isn't. Reviews go a long way towards helping new listeners to find our show. If you have a moment and can leave a rating or review on your podcast player, we'd appreciate it. And if you know someone that might be interested in a story we cover, consider sending them the episode. Minimum Competence is available at minimumcomp.com and wherever you get your finely crafted podcast. If you haven't checked out the website in a while, give it a look. There are complete transcripts and resources for each episode and its corresponding segments, as well as an opportunity to receive new episodes in email newsletter form. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And until such time, if you like potato chips on your sandwich, consider putting a hash brown on your breakfast sandwich. That's living. 